fantastic. Uh, but first, I just want to say a, a big, big thank you for Lee for coming on. I know you're super busy, man. And um, uh, but but yeah, th thanks for coming on, Lee. Firstly, could you mind um, rather than me completely um, do do a terrible job of your intro? Do you mind telling us all who you are and uh, your background and how you come to be in the one of the physiotherapists at the Saints? Yeah. Um, oh, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lee Daggett, I, uh, I'm a physio at Saints currently and also uh, at Move for Physio, one of the directors there. Um, I've been at Saints probably seven or eight years now. I joined in uh, 2013, the year we won the Premiership, which was a good time to join. Uh, yeah. Prior to that, I, uh, for my sins, was a cricketer down at Northampton uh, for five years and played three years at Warwickshire prior to that as well. Um, Studied at uh, Salford University for my physio degree and uh, Durham University back in the day uh, for sports science. And uh, yeah, from up north, um, somehow seemed to be moving further and further south as I went through my cricketing and then physio career. But I feel like we've uh, we've stopped and settled on Northampton now, so we've been here quite a while. But yeah, that's about us. We move forward as a clinic. We are based just near Grange Park and Wotton. Uh, we're on a, a farm estate. We've been open for about four or five years now. And uh, yeah, we've got a, a big group, group of physios with uh, a wide set of uh, different skills. And um, yeah, it's going well. So you, you're, you've been able to get back, well, not even, the, the COVID hasn't had a massive impact on, on what you do specifically, has it, Lee? No, we've, we've pretty much, well, this this one in this lockdown, lockdown two, as, as people are calling it, it, it's not really changed too much. I think most physio clinics have remained open throughout. Um, I, I did a post a few weeks ago where we had an ethical kind of decision to make. And, and the first one, it felt like the eth ethical decision was to close. And we closed for a couple of months um, because we didn't really know what we're dealing with. There's a lot of fear out there. And mm. uh, and, and since then, we've obviously done a lot of reflection and um, a lot of people needed our help and needed our services through that time, which was evident with the, the massive spike we had in patients from, from when we reopened at the beginning of June. Um, so we felt, in, yeah, on reflection that the right thing to do this time was to stay open. And that was supported by government guidance and, and our governing body as well. So, yeah, yeah so we're, we're still open. And... Um, Yep, Saints is carrying on. We've got our first game on, on Friday in the Premiership against Sale. Um, yeah, the little one's still at school. My wife's still at work, so not much has changed this time, thankfully. And we're very lucky that, you know, we're still able to go to work and, and do that. Yeah, fantastic. So, so I mean, a good, good starting point is that you said that you had a big spike um, in patients. So uh, t tell me more about that. What, what, what were some of the you know, sort of typical things that you were seeing? Yeah, well, again, there was there was a big change in behaviour, I think, with the lockdown. And it wasn't just people staying at home. It was the fact people were working from home. They weren't going out. I think as a general rule, step count was reduced. Mm. Um, and, uh, but for a lot of people, running volume increased. You know, so you're going from doing very little during the day and then all of a sudden, boom, you go out for a 45-minute for a run on a daily basis, um, you know, a lot more sitting, a lot more looking down at your phone. I can definitely uh, relate to that one. Um, so there's a big behavior change, which was forced on people. And, um, and it, the body reacts to changes. It, it usually, uh, you know, when you're, when you're training in a gym, when you're working with you guys, it adapts for the better a lot of the time because it's guided in the right way. You, you give exercises which are, are well thought out and um you know and for a purpose uh, and that's the same with any kind of gym program or exercise or, or rehabilitation um but with this the body adapts by getting tight so you're sitting a lot more your, your body adapts to that because you're in that flexed posture a lot more by getting tight through the front of your hips um you know you're looking down at your phone a lot more or you're just generally in a sitting position like this which means you end up getting tighter through the front of your shoulders, which then as a result means that whenever you start to go overhead, whether it's to do, you know, whether you're doing a, a hit workout or something, something, or when you get back to the gym and they, when they eventually reopened, 
that leaves you susceptible to certain types of injuries. Mm. Uh, the same goes with necks. We've seen a lot of people with um, cervicogenic headaches because they're in this side on posture. It's not my good side, but they're in that kind of pokey chin posture, which means you get really tight through the muscles at the top of the neck and quite loose and weak through the muscles on the front. And that can leave people susceptible to, to headaches and neck pain. So we've seen a lot of that. Um, we've seen a lot of anterior knee pain, people who've been running again without sufficient strength potentially to, 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 um, can, yeah, to cope with that amount of volume of running. Um, so yeah, all of those things have, have, been, uh, have been really prevalent. So we've seen yeah, a big spike in knee pain, neck, shoulder, and, and hip related back pain. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, we've got, I've got a list of uh, things that our members have asked us to, to ask, and you, you've already kind of um, mentioned a few of the, the sort of injuries that, that they've brought up. Um, so, so yeah, just, just kind of getting ready for this tonight. You, you'd made a few notes on some of the common things that, that you see, and, um, and you said that you, you'd be happy to share them um, with, with people. So that, you know, if, if you don't mind, that would be fantastic. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I've, I've, I've been through a, a few bits, just I've touched on a few points there. But what I'll try and do is I'll just I'll touch on the point again. I'll maybe suggest a couple of exercises to mitigate it, because the main purpose and, and the reason I've, I reached out to you, Matt, in particular, and, and, and a few other guys is that we want to try and avoid people uh, from having to come and see us. I know that's a terrible business plan, but um, we want people who are trying to be healthy, trying to live healthy lives and trying to you know, adopt some of these healthy behaviors. We want them to be able to transition safely into being regular runners, reg you know, walking a lot further, cycling, whatever your exercise is, we want you to transition from wherever it was that you were to where you want to get. And that's the issue. And that's where we come in is just trying to help people just bridge that gap. Um, so yeah, the first, the first one, and it's, this is a big one is, is, Footwear, all right. So, a, a lot of people. I don't know where most of your your, um, your your clients come from, Matt, and whether they're you know some people may work down in the in the in London down in the city where they're wearing you know really structured shoes. If the for the for the females, they might be wearing uh, high heels. And if that's the case, and you you're in those high heels, your calves adapt, so they they get tight according to what kind of range of movement you need those ankles to be in. So the minute you come out of those heels and that heel drops, the calf actually is really under a lot of strain and it's not, it's not ready for it. So if you're in that position for a long period and you're not wearing your high heels, you might experience some calf or Achilles pain. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's and a common that's, one I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely. And, and yeah. I knew when I was in that position, I, I generally just walked around barefoot. You know, when I was homeschooling, I didn't really put much on my, on my feet. And it's no surprise when when those kind of things happen. Um, you know, we've we've got we've had a lad um, back at, at Saints who who has, has to be isolating for a couple of weeks, and this is really really common. And then that you know you're you're walking around in your slippers for two weeks, and then all of a sudden you go back and you start running the way you were before uh, you had to isolate, and then all of a sudden something just triggers off. You know, and it's it's non-specific. It it'll be you know it could be calf pain, could be back pain, could be knee pain. Really, you've not injured anything, but your body is just trying to adapt and, and you've just got to try and guide that kind of process. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, a, a big thing that I, I observe is, is people don't, don't necessarily realise how much their body is adapting to their, their daily life. So, you know, you, you know most, most of our clients typically will train with us three times a week. So when, when you look at that, you know, we, we do a five minute warm up. We, we do some activation drills, some mobility, and then we take them through maybe a 18 to 24 minute session. So whether that's strength or conditioning or a bit of a combina combination, and then we'll finish off with some, some stretching. But when you actually look at it, you know, you, you really, that the hard, hard work is like 20 minutes. So yeah. ultimately that's, that's only an hour mm. you know, a week, right? Yeah. So the point being is that the other 23 hours in the day or, or at least 12 hours in a day when you're awake, at least or 16 hours, you know, um, those seven days a week, ultimately what you do in that time is, is going to dictate your body way more 
than mm. that one hour of hard work that you, you put in. Yeah. Um, whether it being, and, and this is something that I'm personally really passionate about, and I, I kind of have been for a few years, but I've decided that particularly with the lockdown is, you know, this is this is an area that really needs some attention is with more and more people working from home now, you know, a lot, a lot of employers are just expecting people just to work from home without really thinking it through, like, where am I working? What's my desk space? I talk to so many people and they're just like, plonking their laptop on the kitchen side no, and no. they're like and they're in this horrible position where they're like i'll find out what stool or seat they're sitting in and it's like and they're like this yeah. stool that they're sitting they're hunching over and that they, they've got like dishes around and they've got the kids running around and it's you know and then and they're sort of trying to get through the day um trying to get work done reactively in these positions yeah and who knows you know this this could like people keep talking about the new norm this could be life how we know it to some extent i know i know a lot of businesses are are adopting the this is how we're going to be now that they're closing their office and they're they're saying look this is this is going to save us money and this is whatever this is going to be and so we need to be a bit more switched on i think um and take responsibility for our health at work and and start thinking about well okay well if i'm going to be sitting down for six seven eight hours a day you know what what's my desk gonna look like where am i gonna be sitting how am i gonna be sitting mm. you know how many breaks am i gonna take what am i gonna do in my break uh, i think it's i think it's such an important point and and you know you've the good thing is now people are working at home you've got the ability to just get up from your desk and you're in your own home yeah um so you you can get up and you can mix the day up with some certain types of mobility drills or exercises so you can reset through the day which you might not have the ability to do when you're at work but we, we've been crying out to lots of local big businesses to say look you, you guys you need to actually understand that we're seeing so many people coming through our doors now that have got injuries or issues related to them working from home and all right we've been at we've been in this for quite a while now and a lot of people have, have eventually invested in a mouse or They've invested in a better chair or, or, you know, they've made that box room into an actual functioning study now rather than having to sit at the kitchen table where they're meant to be feeding their kids in the evening. You know what I mean? Where you're able to actually uh, compartmentalize the day rather than just drifting into this whole mess of, of everything. Um, and, and I suppose we're moving towards the mental health side of things there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just as relevant. Um, but yeah, we're, we're saying to businesses, look, we can help you we can carry out a zoom assessment with your your employees and try and improve the situation but i think it's on the employee employer to to look after their staff and realize that these people aren't going to be working for you for very long if they're going to if you if they're going to carry on working from home in the situation they are currently but uh, but in the same sense you've got to take some control there's so much going on as an individual you've got to take control of your own situation and try and make make the best of it haven't you yeah yeah you have i mean i mean the reason why for me it was a big wake up i i'd been i know that i'd got into some bad habits myself um pre-lockdown you know um after setting up our second facility spending a lot of time on the computer like you do when you're running a business and um and, and it certainly uh, had an impact on my own posture i had some real back bad back issues last year um to the point where the first lockdown actually came at a quite a good time because it, it gave me the time to actually really do the rehab exercises I needed to do. Yeah. And, um, and that, that was, you know, and that's what I did. I did I, uh, all the way through the, the first lockdown, did the rehab and it, and it really totally paid off. Yeah. And, um, it's not well, like, and I know this and I'm a trainer. <laughs> you know, so it makes me think, well, Matt, you know this and, you you were making the mistakes and so how 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 is it for everyone else how what chance have they got you know i, know. So I think it it is something that just isn't talked about enough uh, yeah. and, and i really do think we're we're going to be in for you know some bigger issues with with, with our so. back pain and going forwards if things don't change absolutely there's there's so many issues that that are going to raise their heads not now but in a year in two years time um and and you don't want to be you don't want to be a fear monger well, that's not what i'm doing we're, we're trying to shed light on some of these issues so that people can 
we can try to encourage people to take a bit more control because like you said you're, you're a trainer and you still don't necessarily take the advice that you, you that you know <laughs> seriously until really it's a bit too late or you've just ticked over and you're like right now there's, there'll be something that's made you go yeah i need to actually act now and i'm no different absolutely no different but what we've got to try and encourage is that people take control and listen to some of the advice that's out there and, and do it before it's too late because the last thing people need at the moment is something else to worry about and not being able to go to work because of back pain, which was very yeah. easily preventable, is not something that we should be having to worry about. There are plenty of no. other things, but but let's let's take control of that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I don't want to sound yeah, we obviously we don't want to sound doom and gloom. I think I mean I, I've said before, I think it, it really is important for people to know because of the way the world we live in now it is more of an upstream battle there is we have more challenges to face in regards to our health and particularly our movement because obviously you know everything is just too easy now and we, we and now many people's industries are are not so laborious you know there's not so much um movement going on we, we can click a click a button and our shopping can get delivered and you know we just don't you know and so uh, the the key muscles that w require to that allow us to maintain our stability and our strength aren't being switched on enough and yeah. um but um so so you mentioned you mentioned obviously the the, the key one with the high heels what, yeah what are, what are the other um key key observations as well oh. The other one with regards to footwear is, um, I found this as well, um, doing uh, chill wicks in the morning with the little and every day on yeah. the carpet. And your carpet feels soft, but underneath it, it's concrete. <laughs> so the, the force that's going up through the body when you're jumping up and down, you're doing your, your plyometrics that, that Joe was expecting everyone to, to do on yeah. a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. You end up with shin splints, you end up with back pain, you end up with something else because you've no shock absorber like you would you would never come to one of your sessions at the at, you know at the county ground or or, or somewhere else and, and do it barefoot I, I know a few rugby players that do stuff barefoot but um you would wear some trainers you would have something with some shock absorption uh and the same should be in in your living room just think about just stick your trainers on if you're doing a session in your living room just stick your trainers on your, your body's used to it doesn't need to adapt then and you know you're just avoiding one one issue that you you um can easily avoid um but yeah, in terms of other other things, then I mean, the, the general concept that we we adopt here at Move Four is that if you're going to, I think it makes sense. You, if you're going to give someone more mobility, then you, you need to then reinforce it with some exercise or with some strength. All right, and and we never give stretches without some kind of uh, reinforcement. All right, so the the things that we've been that have been caused are by sitting lots. I'm doing it now. I should be around like here, but it's natural. Gravity has its way with us and we're, we're just fighting yeah. against it all the time. Everything's just coming down on itself. Mm. So for shoulder pain in, in particular, you've got a tendon that runs underneath uh, the bone in your shoulder there. When you get tightness through the, uh, through the pec or when you get some altered mechanics of the shoulder blades, that tendon can easily just get banged, all right? That, that space that that tendon has to glide through just gets a lot smaller. So whenever you start going overhead, when you have these issues, you can then easily just pinch that tendon. And a lot of people have had impingement in their shoulder at some point. That can, can get nasty. It can just hang around for a long time. And it's, it's relatively easy to avoid if you do the right things. So for the shoulder in particular, I don't know how my camera's set up, but I, I would do, again, I don't want to teach you guys to suck eggs because you know a lot of, you do a lot of warm ups, you do a lot of mobility work. So there's millions of ways to stretch a pec muscle, but essentially the way that I would start with would be hand on a wall. Do you see me there? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then just walk my feet away from it. Yeah. In any exercise, the stretch like this, I'd sit there for 60 seconds or so. All right, you're not going to make any change in, in 10 seconds. And even stretches like this, if you did nothing for the next day, it would go back to where it was bef uh, before anyway. But then to reinforce that, Again, I'm not sure how you, whether you can see me on my front there. You got me? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So what, what we, one exercise to reinforce it would be on, on the front like that. Get your arms into like a W position. So head being in the middle of the W. All right. 
lifting the elbows and the palms off the floor as far as you can. So you're really working through the back, the shoulder blade and the back of the shoulder. And then all we're going to do is go up into a Y, back into a W. All right, and just awesome. go through maybe 10 to 15 yeah. reps like that. And that's a good, really easy way to just reset your shoulder mechanics a little bit. You're not doing anything fancy. All you're doing is you're getting the muscles working again that you need to support certain positions. Yeah. Um, and you can do that, you know, throughout the day while you're, you know, breaking up the day when you're sat at your home desk. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think I think the key key reminder is with people is if you have a tightness, um, like I've had a few people say just today, oh, you know, I've, I've got a, a, a tightness here, or someone said earlier, you know, that they they struggle with press ups because of that, that they they, they obviously have a, some tightness around the uh, the wrist joint, mm. you know. So I, I said, well, you know, what, what how often are you uh, you mo mobilizing and and you know that area and yeah. And, uh, and he said, you know, just, just at your sessions when we do it. And so yeah. it, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I'm not, that's not me judging because that's a lot of people in the same, like they, they'll only do the mobility yeah. movements when they come to, to training with us. But, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that you probably definitely advocate um, and we do as well is obviously spending a bit of time doing some form of daily maintenance if you can yeah. if it's not daily then at least like three or four times a week know know your areas um what advice do you give around the whole thing around maintenance and um and that kind of thing lee i think i think your point about um you know you're you're exercising for an hour a week with you at three sessions and then the amount of hours where you're not exercising you're doing other things that, in terms of one percenters and, and th areas you can make a big change on, look at that big chunk of time when you're at home or, you know, it's a big area that you can make a, make a change in. So mm. try, and address, try and address that, integrate some secret rehab, you know, <laughs> where people who've, who've got ankle issues, for instance, with us or Achilles pain or, you know, it, it, when, I, when you're getting up in the morning and you're brushing your teeth, just do your calf raises. Just stand on one leg and just keep a, a you know, load up that Achilles tendon a little bit. So then, and then you draw that connection. So every time you're brushing your teeth, you, you'll end up doing it because it becomes a, a good habit. Um, so try and try and link things together. You know, if, yeah. whenever you're pushing up, you know, if think about your t pelvic position, you know, tuck yeah. that tail under, squeeze your bottom. You know, and, and try and that's that's probably the easiest way. Otherwise, it just it just gets it's information. I, I get it. Information goes in one ear, it stays in there for a little while, then eventually something more important comes in. <laughs> um, so just try and draw those connections where you will automatically just think to do that secret rehab. Yeah, yeah, it's working out how you can because people talk about are oh, making lifestyle changes or but but it almost sounds too like yeah whatever like yeah yeah one yeah. day one day i'll start making lifestyle changes but you know yeah. c culturally we are we do adapt to our environments don't we and you know if you look at some third world countries where they're, they're just eating their dinner in a in a deep squat position and yeah. that's just, that's yeah. just their, that's their norm um mm. Because they maybe don't have so nice, comfortable sofa yeah. to sit on, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, that's one. That's one thing I sometimes do. If I'm, you know, if we're just watching TV, I'll, I'll either I've got three things that I'll do. I'll sometimes foam roll. Yeah. Um, actually, I've got a question for you. Um, on because I always doesn't matter how often I foam roll, and my calves are always agony. You know, <laughs> like. You know, I, I <laughs> some parts of your body when you're rolling, they get conditioned to it, don't they? You get used mm. to that pain down your ITB a little bit if you do it on a daily basis, but your calves never quite. My calves never quite... Are always just yeah. Really? I, I I do a lot of I try and I do do a lot of stand up work. Does that yeah. does that affect it? When you say stand up work, what do you mean? Like um... I work standing up. Oh, okay. About seventy yeah. percent of the time. I mean, but if they're, if they're always uh, stiff, then uh, it suggests that there's a uh, you know there's they're fatigued. <laughs> you know the endurance yeah. of of those muscles is is being tested, and maybe some capacity work is a good way to go about it. Um, 
it may be the way you walk. Are you a four foot rut walker? Do you bounce a lot on your heels? Mm, I'm kind of mid foot, really. You're kind of mid foot walker? Okay. Mm. Oh, we, are, we look at that kind of thing, running style for people and how much their load they're putting up through, through their calves. Um, it might be just the fact that you dominate. Whenever you're doing anything in the gym, you, you, you use those calves yeah. well. It's not necessarily the worst mm. thing. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you crack on with what, we're, what, what yeah. we had next on your list. The next one was going to be uh, hips. So, oh, okay, again, big one. Yeah, so this, this one is, this is, this is good, this one, because the hip is so crucial. Or the hip flexors are so crucial to every area of the body. You know, it, you're right in the middle, and if you get some tightness through those hip flexors and it locks you into an anterior tilt in your pelvis, you can end up with all sorts of issues. So, yeah. This is this is my exercise that I generally anyone who's been to see me before. Um, this is my go-to kind of hip uh, hip flexor stretch. So, uh, and hopefully you can hear me, and hopefully you can see me. But yep. essentially, you need a brick, uh, you need a wall, or or something that you can lie in front of and put both feet so uh, feet up the wall like that. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So yep. you've got both feet up against the wall, and you're laying on your front. That's it. My knees knees are flat against the wall. Okay, so yep. there's no space. There. Then I'm going to clear one leg out of the way. Okay. And I'm yep. Gonna, and I'm just going to push Ooh, up like that. Lee, right. Lee, could you move to the right a little bit more and do that? That's it. Just a little bit. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. There we go. All right. So you're going to push up, and yeah. then you can just allow your hip to drop there, and hold that for 20 seconds. Okay. And walk your hands to the left. Now you're going to bias a different part of the hip. And again, 20 seconds there. And then walk your hands to the other side. And then another 20 seconds. Then change leg. Then in between that, you want to then go back to the original leg and try and step through. Okay. I can try and step a little bit further down into the quad and into the thigh. All right? So I'm going to try that after this. <laughs> good one. Yeah. Um, anyone I've seen before, they, they'll have bored them to death about that exercise, but it's, it just clears all different angles and areas of that, that hip flexor kind of complex, which is a good, good little starting point. But like I said, again, I'm sure you guys do a lot of glutes, glute work with, with guys, maybe in your warm-ups, maybe as part of... Yeah, we, glute, glutes and core is pretty much our go-to activation on, on most yeah. workouts, to be honest. Cool. So then uh, you can pick any of those, essentially, but... What we want to do, because we've got tight through the front of our hip, through here, and we're, we're sat in that little bit of flexion, any muscle that gets long, it, it gets weak. Over a long period of time, it will become weak, all right? It wants to be in a bit more middle, middle kind of ground, but when it gets into that type of position, it gets weak. So when we've given you a bit more hip extension, all right? So someone with a, with a tight hip through the front here, when they walk, They'll never quite be able to get their hip all the way back. Or, or when you're kind of in that, sorry, I'll come here. When you're in that kind of position as you're walking through, you'll feel that tightness on the front of the hip. All right? Yeah. When we've opened that up and we allow that hip to extend a bit more, now we want the muscles on the back of the hip to actually reinforce it. So they're pulling you into extension as well. That's yeah. going to allow you to keep that position a lot better. So a good, dead easy exercise to do here is just to stand on one leg, extend the other leg back, slightly soft front knee, and then all I'm gonna do is lift and drop. So we're not going much, I'm keeping the knee straight so I'm not using the hamstring. So I'm driving everything from the hip up here. So anyone this time, we're just, yeah, we're just basically leaning slightly forwards. With, with that, le that leg lift, Lee, is that, so the, the two things you're trying to do there, number one, you're trying to activate the glute, are we? Yeah. 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 And also exactly. trying to just open the hips up slightly. Exactly. So you you would always do that after you've done a, a stretch or some right. mobility work. So you're, you're going to free up that range by stretching it, by releasing it, by rolling it. All right. So you're going to give yourself a bit more. Now you're going to try and keep it. All right. And then if you do that time after time after time, eventually you'll get some carryover. Because I think what most people will find when they do lots of foam rolling, lots of stretching, is that, great, you feel brilliant straight away, but then eventually it just sort of creeps back. And yeah. that stick yeah. just comes back again, doesn't it? 
So yeah. what you're trying to do is just hold on to that extra range of movement that you've got for longer. Yeah. No, I like that. I like that. Um, is, is what? What are some other common common reasons for back pain? Well, I think that that that's probably one of the most most uh, common. Yeah, I mean that the the point I made before about um, the the load going up through the feet, um, axial load, and it, every bit of force that you've got that's going up through the foot is going to end up going through the back. And if you you're getting some big spikes in that sometimes the back doesn't respond very well to axial load, especially yeah. if you've not got um, segmental control of the spine. So if you think at, it, at each level, all right, you've got small muscles that will control those, those vertebra on top of each other, all right? And if, if you've not got the control and the muscle, muscles around that to stabilize the spine, it'd be like if you pushed on both sides of a ruler, yeah. and <laughs> just bend a little bit, okay? Yeah. And by doing that, that can then cause other other little issues. All right. I, I notice a lot with people that have tight hips. Um, you know, lunges become a real issue. Yeah. Um, you know, so so the the prescription really is, is really focusing on exercises like the one that you just showed us, and and opening yeah. those hips up. Um, yeah. Know, what sort of time frame are people looking at before they can start lunging? Because what happens is with the lunge is that back foot just starts to rotate outwards because yeah. the, hips, the hips can't take it. I think you've just got to, uh, with that, I wouldn't stop them lunging per se. Right. Um, okay. But what I would just make sure is if you can't lunge with, do you want to get, if, if you've got tight hips, all right, you're going to get locked in this arch position, that lower dosis in the lower back. So whenever you stretch those hips at the front, it's going to move more into lower back lordosis, which by doing that can then pinch through the facet joints in your lower back, all right? So by all means, you can lunge or you can split squat as long as you can keep that posterior chill tilt on through, by utilizing your glutes, you won't get very much depth. Yeah, but yeah. That's by doing good. that, you're actually it's an eccentric contraction of the hip flexors as well so you're feeling that up through the back quad and time after time after time that will increase the range of movement that you have through that kind of front of the hip and, and the quad so by, by doing it but doing it with good control even with a modified depth that's going to be that's going to have a therapeutic benefit as well yeah nice nice right. what, what, what about knee knee problems in general lee because we, we do yeah. get you, you know what what are your general um go to you know prescriptions yeah well the big the big thing we we seen uh, of late is anterior knee pain so that's pain or generally not it describes anything around the front of the knee but generally what we see is uh, patella related pain okay and that comes from you've got the patella and it's that that glides within a, a groove okay i'm trying to think of my hands so your patella glides within the groove on the bottom of the femur, all right? And if you get some tightness up the quad, different parts of the quad, it can just alter the mechanics of where that patella moves, all right? And then that can just cause a little bit of irritation on the back of the patella or on the front of the femur, okay? So we've seen a lot of that. And the way, what, what tends to happen, not always, but what tends to happen is that people will they don't use their their hips so it may be people that have had back pain in the past so whenever they're sitting down they'll sit down like this do you know what I mean? you, you see that stiff kind of back posture and they're not using those those glutes at all so every time that knee comes forward so that way whenever the knee comes forward you're driving that that kind of or you're making it tighter where that patella is meant to be gliding okay so what we try and do with those people is we try and move them back into a little bit more, feel the weight further back in the foot and try and load up through the posterior chain. So feeling more in the hamstrings and the glutes and mm -hmm. just holding the quads and the knee a little bit more. Um, and that, that takes a little time. Um, but as a concept for people, if you've got some knee pain around the front of your knee, around that patella, try and think about when you're walking up the stairs, think about putting the weight further back towards the heel and, and pushing through your hip rather than taking the knee over the foot and pushing through the thigh. Yeah. And do you, do you generally just make running a red flag with um, 
With knee no, pain, or would you, would you say it depends on if someone is carrying extra weight or? Yeah, it, it, it really depends. We have to take it time by time, but I, I will only suggest stopping running if I really, really think they need to. I think a lot of people use things like running nowadays for uh, mental health reasons and you know they're very attached to their routines of running and it means a lot more to them than just an exercise mm. so if you tell someone you tell a runner not to run well they're going to lose faith in us first of all because they they don't want to hear that and it's going to have bigger repercussions so if we can somehow give them a different way of running or reduce volume running or shorten their stride length or you know something like that yeah keep them going then that's what we try to do um yeah i think i think that's a really good point actually because quite often you, you the thing is with health and fitness it's nothing's ever always black and white is it and some sometimes sometimes you know saying completely no to something isn't always the best answer sometimes actually the, the best thing is can we minimize this to the point where it's not going to cause harm absolutely like, you know and and with running like you can you can sprint and and put a hell of a lot of power through your knees and if you've got bad knees that's going to hurt but you can also really if you can build up the skill to do it you can, yeah. you can be really soft on your feet when you jog it and absolutely. you know you can take all of that that pressure out and uh yeah i mean it's it's, it's always a tricky one because everyone has their own philosophies on things don't they in the, in the health and fitness world and sometimes they'll they'll completely red flag exercises and say well you can't yeah. do any you can't do any overhead work because you've got a slight shoulder impingement or yeah. you can't do any squatting because you've got this hamstring issue or any deadlifting because you've got you know t tight hamstrings you, you can't touch your toes and yes yeah. um it, it is a tricky one because it, we we as coaches and you know therapists we want we want people to not we don't want to cause more pain that's for sure yeah but at the same time we don't want to have to tell people they can't do everything no no i completely agree you we're balancing scales and and, and that's what we try to achieve at here at move four but also that's our philosophy at saints as well you're trying to, if somebody's injured then what can you get out of them in that day you know you've got a, an athlete with you you've got eight hours, 10 hours to work with them. What, how can you maximize their day? And that's what we try and do here as well. If they can't do a, a split squat, well, they can probably do it. You know, they might be able to do a pistol squat. There's, there's millions of variations on, on movement patterns, which means that you can still put load through the body, or, but you can avoid certain uh, stressing, certain types of tissues, certain areas. Um, and, and that's what you have to do. I think good physios, good good coaches will will find a way to move around something rather than just saying, okay, that's an issue, let's stop it. If somebody says that, uh, you've lost all faith in that person for me because you, you've, got, you've got to problem solve and figure out a better way. The pro problem is, Lee, I, I don't know if you found this, but, you know, um, maybe slightly controversial, but a lot, a lot of people get told by their GPs or, or doctors you know, just rest. Mm. That's, their, that's their prescription, just rest. And and, the, and a lot of people, when they come to LPT who have had some sort of injuries, they're, they're really, they're, the, one of their biggest mindset problems or challenges is, am I allowed to move? And, no. you know, one of my feelings is actually not moving is worse, yeah. is worse overall because of, again, all of the reasons that we've already talked about, you know, being in certain sitting in a seated position for long periods of time like yeah. if you t tell someone to rest well how are they resting yeah yeah effectively <laughs> exactly and i think we, we are in an educational kind of process to to educate other you know um stakeholders in in healthcare so doctors uh nurses anyone that that people would go to for their healthcare advice. Sure, sure. We can't, we can't be ju judgment. I mean, you know, GPs can't be expected to know everything. I think no. the, only reason, the only reason I mention it is just, you know, because so many people are being told just, just rest yeah. that you've got that injury. I, I having been a physio for as long as you have been, and and you know, a sportsman as well. Yeah. But what would you say to just the how adaptive the body is? 
because uh, mm. I think a lot of people feel like once they have a certain injury, it's like, oh, that this is it. Like, I'm, I'm never going to be able to do this again. I'm never going to be able to run again. I'm, and it yeah. can be a real, like, I can really can affect people's outlook and mindset. It can. And I think it's, it's it really does come down to that. It comes down to mindset. It comes down to dedication and commitment. Like, the things that I've seen people come back from when they've been dedicated, when they've invested everything in it, are, are ridiculous. Um, and there really is no, it's a bit corny to say, but there's no limits to, you know, the, the body regenerates. We're learning more and more about how things, it used to be that we thought that, you know, if you, uh, if you damaged a disc in your back, it doesn't heal. You know, we're now learning that it, it probably does. Looking at tendons as well and how, tendons we used to think well if you damage the tendon you've got to repair it it's not going to you know once you've got tendon problems you've got tendon problems now we're starting to learn that now you can actually change tendon structure by loading it in certain ways um and i think we're winning that battle to some extent now i think education is is moving in that way i think most people now i think the big one over the last sort of couple of decades was arthritis which is it's going to affect all of us at some point you know, we're living longer and longer we're leading active lifestyles um arthritis it, now the treatment is movement and i think most people know that um, we don't see many people now that come to us with a an arthritic knee for instance and have just been resting it because it, it's sore most people are, are, know that i think the next thing is now tendons and other things but I think we we need to, as, as people who work in, in this industry, um, we, we can't expect everyone to know that what their problem is. So that's what we're here for, is to mm. give a clear diagnosis, give people confidence that, yeah, by running, you're not going to make, a lot of people will say, I'm worried about making it, you know, causing long-term harm. Well, we can give them confidence with a lot of things that this isn't going to, you know, these are safe things to do. You're not going to end up with long term damage to this structure if you continue to run. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, I think, what where you can really make a big difference. Are there any um, typical like milestones or, or, you know, how can I put it in fitness? You, you can have sort of benchmarks, can't you, for, you know, I, I want to be able to lift at least one and a half times my deadlift weight, or I want to be able to, you know, do X amount of burpees, or I want to run a 10K in, in 60 minutes. P people can have like uh, very simple benchmarks and they know that when they're outside of those benchmarks, they've got a bit of work to do in that area. Yeah. With, with movement, like the, the typical ones that we look at LPT are, are things like the deep squat. We look at, can, can you touch your toes? Just real simple yeah. things. Can you get your arm above your head in a vertical plane? Yeah. Um, you know, are these sorts of things that what 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 are what typical ones that you look well, at it, and feel like we should be able to do in going on into later life? Yeah, I think we, you've got to think about uh, you've got to break it down into the demands of what people are trying to do. So if you know if you're running, for instance, you know you you could have more than two times your body weight going through your your, your leg. You, you know, sometimes I remember when I was playing cricket, there was research out there to say that. There was nine times my body weight potentially going through my front front leg. My body needs to withstand nine times my body weight. So if I weigh 80 kilos, I don't, <laughs> um, then, um, you know, you can work out what the maths are there. That's that's huge amount of force that's going through there. Mm. But for instance, you're looking at a calf raise. And when you're walking, if you need to achieve two times your body weight to, to do that well, then you need to, you know, you need to be having a bit of weight on your back when you're doing a calf raise, for instance, to try and mimic that. Uh, and we do a lot of screening at Saints for that, using force plates and stuff to try and try and find out more about our players and, and learn, you know, what kind of areas they might be more at risk for. Yeah, yeah. Are there, are there any, uh, do, do you have any, like, particular benchmarks that you'd recommend people work towards? Oh, it's, it's tough, really. It's tough because uh, I suppose so just, what, just not, what, obviously non non athletes, basically like people that just they just want to go through their everyday life without any pain and you know discomfort. Yeah, yeah I mean the, the the fact is, I suppose that somebody um, who comes in here and can't do ten bridges and has hamstring tendinopathy 
you can draw a direct correlation there and say, well, because you can't do 10 bridges, that's left you susceptible to uh, mm -hmm. brain pain. Whereas there might, there might be a lot of other people out there that can't do 10 bridges, but never have any issues. So it's really, it's really hard to blame Very personal thing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, like you say, the things that we look at when people come in here, we look at, we try and just find a test which gives you some information about every, every joint or every area. So you look at mobility with a knee to wall test, you'd look at calf function or ankle uh, strength or stiffness with a, you know, a repeated hop or a calf raise. Um, you know, we look at single leg um, squats. Uh, if, you're, if you're all over the place, we look at quality rather than numbers um, and, and, and assess that quality of movement um, as a risk factor for, for potentially, you know, future injury. Brilliant, brilliant. Before we get just to, I've got a couple of last uh, member questions. Was there anything yeah. left on your... On your no, for my part, no, I think the, the main um, point that overrides it all is, is think about your workloads. Think about, um, you know, like I said before, if you've been in isolation for two weeks and then you go back to running the same volume you were running before, expect some soreness and you mm. are at increased risk of injury. Be, be careful with increases that, that just spike overnight and and load is literally anything going you know going through your body load is as simple as well i'm going to start reading on my front every night because and then i'm finding myself in a lot more back extension so i'm putting a lot more load through my facet joints every night yeah yeah, you know, so think about load as everything. People think about load as, as lifting weights all the time, don't they? But you yeah, know, your your body weight is a load. Like you gotta absolutely, absolutely. The amount of new parents like, that come in to see us who who have shoulder pain, neck pain on one side, and you dig into it. The first question is, oh, which arm do you tend to hold the baby in or feed yeah. the baby with? And they're like, oh yeah, here. Like, that's why. But, you, you know, you, there's some things you just can't change, obviously, mm. but it's about trying to mitigate the, the effects of it and, and reduce the impact of, of injury that's caused by it. So so one that's come up a few times is uh, we've got some tennis elbow, frozen shoulders. Um, frozen shoulders, actually, is one that is uh, I've seen more and more of. What mm. I've done a bit of research, and it seems to be, a, a bit of an unknown still with a frozen shoulder. It, it is. With regards to research, it's a real minefield. It's not a good thing. Uh, it affects certain people at certain times of life. It's essentially a thickening and an inflammation around the capsule in the shoulder and just limits movement. And it's painful. I, I think one thing we do know as physios with that is it does benefit, as painful as it is, it benefits from mobilization and treatment. Um, we can increase that range of movement with sh frozen shoulder. Um, there are some interventions that surgeons do. Uh, do. We've had uh, some local surgeons doing some um, that they put saline into a joint and try and blow it back up again, mm. uh, which is quite effective. And there's some surgical release things. But generally, physiotherapy is good, but expect pain. That's the thing. It's going to be yeah. painful. And, and in truth, you it's the, the capsule is is irritated it's sore it's not it's all it's very tight you've got to go through that pain to make progress otherwise it, it rarely will you know make quick progress but it will get there at some point yeah well we we've had we have seen a couple of members that just uh, that just worked through it and that it seems that the exercise and, and regular mobility and moving you know it has really had a had a really strong impact so yeah um, that's yeah. Uh, tennis elbow. Tough one. But again, if, if you've, it, it's a tendon issue. All right. Um, so what we know with tendons is they, they respond well to load. Okay. So the, the, the only way you're going to get, when you get a, a, a tendon, which is sore and irritated and inflamed, you end up with more nerves just floating around there, more irritated nerves. You end up with more blood vessels that, that eventually form around there. Because a lot of things like tennis elbow, uh, like Achilles tendinopathy, like patella tendinopathy, that people have had them for a long time. So those kind of changes happen. Um, so what you need to do, you need to, you need to essentially just send some load down that tendon, all right? And you do that, tennis elbow in particular, is if you resist in that position up, 
that's the tendon up there and that's that muscle that runs up here that will be painful but you need to actually recruit that muscle and that tendon sorry i'm struggling with my camera yeah. to make any, to make any actual change there all right so you need to again it's not looking day on day what you're going to do you're going to cause pain all right it's going to annoy it but that's kind of what you want because it's a chronic issue you want to inflame it you want to make it angry because that's how the body adapts if you don't ever if you rest it the tendon is not going to change the pain will go away because you're not using it but what happens is then you become deconditioned your grip strength reduces you you've got you know you've not got the same function that you had and then that moves further up the chain because then your shoulders having to do more you know it's mm. it's one of those kind of things but it's it's debilitating and it's very sore a lot of the time but you need to load that wrist extension position all right if that's too sore to do just hold it get a heavy dumbbell whatever okay. you can whatever you can cope with and the best research out there at the moment uses a protocol of about four to five sets for about 45 second hold so find a find a, a dumbbell which is appropriate for that kind of uh, you know sets and reps and 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 go through that on a daily basis yeah that's great D daily basis yeah yeah absolutely absolutely sometimes more it's it that's your that pain specific, is that a specific prescription for that that um injury tendon just tendon yeah. in general yeah so if you've got a tendon, in general. Or knee, okay yeah or a knee or anything that's tendon related that's the best research we've got at the moment with regards to how to make tendon change and one and, more time and, that was 45 seconds yeah, 45 oh, yeah. seconds for four or five sets. So it's quite hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With with any re recovery between the sets? Um, I, I, what I tend to do with my, my guys is uh, maybe 45 seconds on, 45 seconds off. But 45 yeah. seconds is not very long, so what happens is generally you end up with a couple of minutes in between. But that's fine. That's not a problem. But that, if, in terms of pain relief, that's your pain relief. That hold in a neutral position is your pain relief. Okay. Right. Okay. To make, to make you're not going to make that much tendon change here by holding. All right. Mm. But instead of having to be reliant on medication, a lot of the time that can be a good way to start the day. If you want to make tendon change, eventually you've got to be in a position where you're not in as much pain. All right. So that's a good way to do it. Then you can start to load through extension. You're building that muscle strength up. Cool. Well, I've got I've got one more. Uh, I have this is from Cat. I have permanent crunchy shoulders. When I roll them, particularly forwards, uh, they make very loud clicking, crunching noises. Um, I fairly regularly get neck pain that comes up from the shoulder and yeah. makes it hard to turn um, and bend my neck. Okay. Yeah, that's really common. Um... I think a lot of people uh, end up with that kind of, it's not very nice. And when you hear clicking, especially like a lot of people, you can actually hear it. If you were stood next to someone and they're doing that and they're hearing these crunches and I've got a few crunches to be honest. What that generally reflects is faulty mechanics in the shoulder. So a lot of people think of the shoulder and they think of this, right? They think of that, that's the shoulder joint, that's right. But what they don't see because they can't see it in a mirror is their shoulder blade. All right. Now, the shoulder blade is essentially where where the the, the shoulder joint is connected to the the body. You know, it's not. Um, it, it is crucial in giving that foundation for that shoulder movement. If your shoulder blades are winging or and they're all over the place, that the mechanics of the shoulder blades isn't working well, you end up with some crunching, some clicking. You end up with some pain. You can, you know you can end up with all sorts of things. Um, not all the time. There are people out there who have faulty mechanics in the shoulder it's, and it's irrelevant. But if you're getting pain and you have faulty mechanics in your shoulder, it's likely that they're connected. The, the soreness that you're getting into your neck, you've got a couple of muscles that run off the shoulder blade. And again, if they get tight, they can change how the mechanics of that shoulder blade work. So they're all connected. And what, you, what the skill is with a good physio is trying to unpick that and find the different things that are all feeding into the same problem and trying to just break them down one by one, make it a bit more of a clearer picture and then and then start to rebuild the strength of, and the mechanics of that those joints at that point. Nice, nice. I mean, could, could, um, could, could workstation be an element with that as well? Just like- it, and, 
Only yeah. Only because I know Kat. I know she works from home, and uh, I don't know. I don't know what you know. She she may have good work posture or whatever, but she, she yeah. might not as well. So. But I, I, again, it goes back to that that pokey chin that I was I was doing before. You know, if you're sat like that, mm. you just have to know what the what the first thing was that triggered off this this kind of cascade of events. It could have been the fact that you're in this kind of posture. Then you end up with tightness through these muscles, which pulls on the shoulder blade, which changes the, the you know the mechanics in the shoulder. It might not have been that she might have had good posture, but she might have for some reason. Uh, irritated her shoulder joint, which knocked off some of the strength in the shoulder, which then moved further up. So you, you, it's hard to know whether it's from the top down or from the bottom up. Mm. A lot of the ways, a lot of the time, that, that's almost irrelevant. People want to know what was the thing that caused it. They always ask me. And, and I'm going to be honest, the majority of the time, I don't know. But what I do know is that that you've got that you've got half a dozen issues that we need to sort, sort your problem out. And, and then we just go at it that way. I guess that's the problem, though. That very rarely is there one thing that you know the body doesn't work that way. You know, if you, people think if they've got a neck or a back problem, then the problem is the back, whereas actually that, that's nowhere near the problem. That's just the outcome of of about Absolutely. five real, six or seven other real problems. Yeah, big time. And and I think there's the other thing with diagnoses. You know, people want a name for whatever it is that they're suffering with. Um, and in fact, that's not always that helpful. I think it, it, it's, I, I look at that in some of the mental health kind of issues as well. And, and the words depression, anxiety, you know, all of these things that it, it, they almost have some stigma attached to it. And once that word is, is, um, Labeled, is given, yeah. people then, you know, they then label themselves. That's how they look at themselves. I'm someone with depression or I'm someone with tendon problems or with, a, a, a back that's injured or you know they start to feel uh fragile they start to feel like their body isn't strong the body's an incredible thing and you can you can get pain when there's nothing wrong all right it, the pain doesn't always reflect structural damage um and even if there is structural damage it can repair and even if it doesn't repair the body finds ways of working around it now, I think this is the big thing is, is getting people to be confident around their bodies, confident to move and, uh, and, and yeah, and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there any, I, I always like the analogy of the body is like, think of like a, a Formula One racing car, like, because they, they are the, the high, one of like the highest performing cars, right? And, but, yeah. but behind the scenes, all of the time, what you don't see when they're not on the track is all of the the you know the, the maintenance and the upkeep to to get them in the the best shape so that they can go as fast as possible without crashing and i think yeah. that's a good analogy for your body is is yes when you're doing your workout you want to be smashing that workout so you get stronger you know fitter mo you know improve your aerobic anaerobic fitness um but don't forget that to get the best out of that workout your body needs to be moving well and yeah. this is one of the um this is one of the hardest harder parts of being a coach is is a lot of people uh, so we will we'll, we'll do maybe mobility sessions sometimes some of our members love it mm. um, but i've got to say some of our members find it oh that boring stuff yeah. you know that, yeah. you know that stuff oh yeah, yeah just laying on your back and doing a few yeah. movements and um yeah. they just want to do the the pounding and you know, we, we obviously have to educate people and that's our job to say, look, you know, we, we can pound you, but you're down the line. Break. It's not going to be good. You're going to break. Yeah. You're going to crash yeah. like the Formula One car if they don't service it. Um, exactly. Do, exactly. Do you have any daily maintenance recommendations or do, do you do anything on a daily basis that you, oh. you recommend people do to kind of just, just maintain their body? I should do more. <laughs> I have a list of ailments as long as you're on. Um, no, I, I, again, it, I, I wouldn't prescribe a, a generic um, plan to anyone. Uh, I'd have to take take account of what their, their particular issues are, as I'm sure you would. But you know, if you yeah. were prescribing it, um, I think as a general rule, I feel that sometimes people are uh, they get very obsessed and tight and, and uh, attached to rolling, foam rolling, yeah, and, and stretching. And I think that that's it's great and it makes you feel good and that's important 
but it, it doesn't make long-term change. So whatever it is that you're going to do on a daily basis, do something that reinforces something. Do something that loads part of your body. Um, mobility is uh, essentially flexibility, but with a, an element of, of strength and, and you know, trying to reinforce it as well. Um, I, I did a course a couple of years ago um, called Functional Range Conditioning. It's like an American kind of approach. And it's a brilliant approach to mobility. So if anyone's looking for, they've got loads of stuff on, um, on what you call on Instagram and, and YouTube. So have a look at that if you're looking for some kind of daily mobility stuff. That's good. Okay. What, what's the name of that again? I'll make a note of that. It's called Functional Range Conditioning. Uh, there's, a, there's a group class kind of um, part of it, which is called Kin Stretch. Um, and that's yeah, it's it's useful stuff, and I, I find it's it's really good. Fantastic. Okay, well, um, listen, Lee, uh, I really yeah, thank you, thank you for your time. I think we've pretty much covered. Uh, <laughs> yeah, covered I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of our members are obviously you know Kettering, Northampton based, you know. Um, so you know, just to kind of finish things off, did you want to? Just yeah. share a, bit, a little bit more about if they want to contact you and get in, get in touch with any um, therapy with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're looking for some inspiration for rehab exercises and things like that, we have a fair few on our on our website. So if you go to move for dot com, um, I think it's forward slash video resources. There's, we've got loads of videos that are uploaded on there. Um, with my, yours truly narrating over them, um, but there's a bit of inspiration there. Um, but if you if you've got any issues, drop us a line. Uh, you can contact me at lee at moveforphysio.com. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Give us a follow. Um, and if you um, yeah, if you if you think you want to come and see a physio, then give us a shout. We'll get anyone on this this webinar or who's watching now. We'll give you a fifty percent off an initial. Just tell them tell us that you were. Oh, wow, thank you. Here. And um, if you're not sure that physio is for you and you don't want to invest the money yet, we're doing what we call a discovery uh, visit. So it's essentially 15, 20 minutes. Come up to the clinic. Come and have a look round. Um, you've only seen a little bit, some, some shirts behind my head. Come and have a look around, speak to a physio and ask some questions, put them on the spot, and then you can find out whether physiotherapy is for you. Because um, I think that's really important. You need to have that that trust and that buy-in before you come. So, um, yeah, but either way, just drop me a line and, and uh, we'll, we'll help you out. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, Lee. Well, um, good luck for the first game the weekend. No worries. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. And, and good luck. Uh, yeah, well, um, thank, thanks everyone for all of your uh, all of your questions. Uh, thanks to Lee uh, for his words of wisdom. Take action, guys. Stop sitting down so much. Get mobilizing. Get strengthening. Take care. <laughs>